Since 1964, the Police Armed Defenders Squad have been the last line of defence when lives are under threat. A lot of what the AOS do probably goes unrecognised. As violent crime surged in the 70s, the squads would be tested under fire time and again in the very worst situations. I'd be a liar if I said at the time I wasn't terrified. In the 80s, the anti-terrorist branch of the squad came out of the shadows. I got exposed to things that um, I never thought I'd ever get exposed to in the police force. In November 1990, the anti-terrorist squad played a deadly game of cat and mouse, not against a foreign terrorist, but in Otago's tiny seaside town of Aramoana, against a man named David Gray. You're just constantly waiting for that shot to ring out. It was like a sniper's paradise. <laughs> And there's just this, this, this huge amount of fire just going boom, 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 straight down towards my head. My team leader was on my shoulder, and he just returned fire straight in, back into that window. There's fire going both ways past me. Well, I just pulled away as quickly as I could down to the edge. I, I didn't even look for any holes. I just knew that I was OK. I, I, was, I was great, and I felt great. We were just absolutely stoked that we had our man. Roger, just keep your hands done. I went round to the front with Ash, and we just um, held on the front doors of this place about 12 metres out on, on the boundary. We fired into the house, fired high to keep him down. The idea that hopefully there was no one else in the house, so I fired high. Let him know that we were here. He wasn't gunning down women and kids. Hello, David! Um, please! Then Pete and I called on him to come out. You know, put your weapon down and th that's part of our call. So that was done, you could hear this call going on. Well, at this stage, I'd thrown some tear gas in, we had a gas mask on, and we were yelling out to him to come out, and, uh, and eventually he did, he came out the front door. If he'd just come out and put his hands in the air, no matter what he'd have done prior to that, you couldn't shoot him. No matter what you thought, no matter how repulsive, no matter how how much loathing you had for him, you could not shoot him. He came to the front door and, uh, unlike the movie, he sort of just slinked out of the door. And I sort of describe it like a rat leaving a, um, leaving a ship, you know, just trying to slink out. Oh, please, don't be with him. I wasn't even sure, and this is how bizarre it seems, I wasn't even sure this was the right guy. And how bizarre is that? I couldn't see the gun for a start off, and then uh, as he turned, he had the gun um, on the inside between him and the door as he slunk out of the door. Straight away, um, I called on him, yelled out, stop police, and um, straight away, he just started bringing his gun up and um, shooting towards us. We opened up on him, and he was shot five times, and he dropped. And then he started screaming, kill me, effing kill me. Kicked his weapon away, and then just tried to apply the handcuffs. And I pointed my weapon, which is a MP5 machine gun, at his head and I seriously thought about killing him for a second. But I didn't, because I'm not a murderer. Roger, we have the offender. He has been injured. It's quite serious. He was still struggling, and it was a real effort. You know, we were kicking him and trying to, trying to subdue him to, um, to, get the, to get the handcuffs on, and finally we got the handcuffs on. He'd been shot in the head, and there was blood everywhere, and there was mucus all over his hand. And he pulled his hands out of the handcuffs. He must have been extremely strong. The Iroquois was uh, arrived pretty quickly with the medical staff on board, and he received medical treatment really quite quickly. And he died at the scene. After such a harrowing 24 hours, the ATS squads walked back out of the village. As we walked out along, along the road, the, a lot of the people had come forward to get back into their houses. 
and they sort of lined the road. And, and we sort of walked through the middle of them, and they just, they clapped, clapped us. Yeah. Thought, yeah, strange. I just went home and, and tried to put it out of my mind. Everyone has dealt with numerous situations. You have to move on. You can't dwell on it. If you dwell on it, then you're finished. The next morning, I got up quite early, and my, my youngest boy was the only one still at school. He was at high school. And, and I was at the kitchen table. I, I was reading the paper. I was reading through all the stuff. And he comes out, and I thought, you know, what am I going to tell him? Because he'll want to know about these things. So he grabbed his lunch, which was in the fridge, and he went to the door, and then he said, um, you could have been killed there. What about us? And he walked out. Hmm. I thought, he's probably right. Yeah, and that sort of um, made me think about being in the squad, and I thought, shit. Then you start thinking about things like that, you know, which you don't. You don't ever think you'll get hurt. None of us ever thought we'd get shot. You know, why would we get shot? Armed defenders' squad call-outs don't need to have a high death toll to be devastating. The West Coast's Ken Foreman recalls one offender trying for suicide by cop. Jimmy was going to go out in a blaze of glory. He had the two firearms, the 800 rounds, and yeah, the next thing I see is Jimmy Malone coming over the back fence at the property. There was a horse paddock, and around the outside of it, it had a fence. And with all this gear that Jimmy was carrying, I knew that he would have to stop at that fence and put something down to get over it. He got to the fence. And then he climbed over, and that was when we challenged him. Oh, police! If he reached for either of those firearms, then it was going to happen. Back away! Back away! Do you! That is as close as I've ever come, or ever want to come, to pulling the trigger. That's when it all sort of started. I started to get the shakes. And I thought I'd lost my bottle. I thought, you know, you've got to leave the squad. You're no good to them anymore if you're going to do this. And, you know, it was only very brief. It was probably only for five minutes. And then I was, I was as good as gold. But I really thought that I'd lost my bottle. It scared me. It scared me that, that I'd reacted that way. And I reacted it in a way that I didn't understand. Every time I think of that wee fence, I think it saved Jimmy Malone, and it certainly saved me. And Jesse and I, when we were driving back to Greymouth, we went back together, and Jesse looked at me and he said, you could have shot him. I said, yes, Jesse, I could have, but you and I wouldn't be driving back to Greymouth right now we would be hauled off somewhere until we were interviewed. I said, we can do without that. We need to get back and have a couple of beers. <laughs> Land across the other side of the road here. At the back of the address is a large football field park. From the beginning, the armed defenders squad was male dominated. In the mid 90s, Sasha Haskell became one of the first females to join the squad. Seeking a new challenge, the former territorial soldier and national rep footballer arrived at the police college for her AOS selection course. Fortunately, because I had been in the army, there was a little bit of street cred, I suppose, having done something that was actually, on the face of it, a lot more um, regimented and military than, than the AOS is. And people like Sasha and, and a number of others have proved that uh, they're more than capable. There were some women constables that were just outstanding and left the blokes in the shade. And there were some policemen who were outstanding, you know, I mean, just all people. It didn't make any difference. I was small, physically smaller than everyone else, so I'd always end up sort of getting pushed into ceilings and through little uh, manholes and things like that. So I sort of ended up sort of playing that kind of role. So they sort of like, oh, we're such, we'll just, we'll just chuck her up there. When you've got a female offender, it's certainly nice to have a female officer dealing with her. 
A lot of the gang places that we'd go to, there'd be females there. So even though I was in total black and no one would know that I was a woman, I kind of ended up looking after females. Just was an added protection. So if there was accusations later on about, you know, inappropriate behaviour, it kind of took that out of the equation. There's one squad room and everyone gets changed in there, so unfortunately for them, they got to see me in my underwear, but um, not for long. <laughs> like, everyone was sure not to look at me. I was sure that I didn't look at them. You know, the overalls weren't really conducive to, to the female anatomy, so you'd be dying to go to the toilet, and the zippers sort of have a zipper at the top and a zipper at the bottom, so you'd have to get almost completely naked to go to the loo. So if you're a boy, it's sort of a little bit easier. His girlfriend had warned them he had a gun and ammunition and that he was unstable. One of the most dangerous jobs on the squad is searching buildings and facing offenders on their own patch. As the Christchurch squad was reminded on an August morning in 1991. The information was that there is a, um, a person with a gun in like a big two-story bed sit place. And uh, our, our brief initially was to do the cordon contain and I, was, I got positioned in a house uh, right next door to where the offender's bedroom was supposed to be. We went up the stairs, made sure the hallway was clear and the offender was uh, located in the room. Instead of cordoning the whole house, knowing that there was numerous little bed sets within there, just the cordon, just that one room. So that, that was their brief and, and they went up. There was voice appeal made to the offender, which he refused to answer. And after a period of time, I got the instruction, or oh, stuff it ash, kick the door in. And then went to the uh, left-hand side of the door and peered through. And I just exposed the smallest part of my body as I could, which was my hands and part of my face. And then I was shot with a shotgun. All I heard on the, over the radio was that um, Ash had been shot and um, they couldn't recover him. And um, I, I thought he'd been killed. And uh, like Ash was a, was a close friend of mine. I'd been shot in the face. It was just like being smacked with sort of a hammer. I then attempted to shoot the offender, but I couldn't because my revolver was jammed with pellets, but also both my hands were split open. And then a, another shot fired. Then a big hole appeared in the hallway wall. And I thought, oh shit, he's just gonna come out here and shoot me now. Because <laughs> I was virtually defenseless. Someone threw tear gas in, but of course I had no mask, so I was coughing up tear gas and, and bleeding. And my hands didn't work. <laughs> the offender had jumped out the uh, side window, so he was caught by our guys further down on the on the back or in the backyard of this property. So that, that was all taken care of. So I came down from the house and, and came out to see what I could do to help Ash. Well, I actually went to a window and yelled out to get me a ladder. I did actually swear at the time. I think it was get me an effing ladder. Well, they didn't get me an effing ladder. Well, they assisted me down the stairs where I very romantically chundered on the footpath. I was pretty shot up in the face and shot up in the hands and myself and another one of the guys just joined up and we just um, carried him down the road to the, to the ambulance. Constable Ashton's hand caught most of the blast, but three pallets hit him in the head. One went through his throat and lodged near his spine. He was OK, but it was a close call. I got this one for being shot, and I got this one for shooting at someone, so... I can tell you, it's better to give than receive. Our top story, a huge police operation on the Coromandel Peninsula in the hunt for four dangerous prisoners on the run. The four, two of them convicted murderers, escaped from Auckland's medium security prison at Paremaremo on Monday night. In 1998, a very high-profile call-out brought the armed offenders squad onto TV screens throughout the nation. Operation Escape. 
seeking four dangerous escapees from Paremoremo saw AOS teams from all over the North Island descend on the town of Tairua. The camouflage looks military, but they're not soldiers. These men are police officers. For two decades, this unit was known as the anti-terrorist squad, but in the early 90s became the special tactics group. The name change was because their job was now much broader than guarding against terrorism. For many AOS members, joining the STG is the pinnacle of their career. To be asked to join their group was quite an honour. I got exposed to things that I never thought I'd ever get exposed to in the police force. They asked if I wanted, was interested in uh, joining the STG, and um, I had no idea what the STG was, so I said, yes, absolutely, that's what I'm here for. I'd love to join the STG. In Tairua, the STG worked alongside armed defenders' squads. Their training and tracking saw them sent deep into the rugged hills of the Coromandel. There was a lot of bush walk, walking to do and, and clearing, and every single report that came through in regards to Taylor and his, and his group would be um, handed to us and each unit would be sent off, whether by vehicle, by helicopter or by foot. Let's make no bones about it. The, the, the individuals concerned were, uh, were violent criminals. You know, they, they were a serious threat to the community. They had been disturbed in this um, address just slightly south of Tyra in a very, very lovely home. Because we didn't know if the offenders were in there or whether they'd left, we knew there were firearms involved. The decision was made to cordon, put a tight cordon in around the building, wait for some daylight so we could see better, um, and then start voice appealing uh, where we could control things better. And as the sun was coming up, um, another guy and I were crouched at the level of the concrete and in front of us there was an object uh, three or four feet away sitting on the concrete. And as the light came up, it sort of came into focus and we were both staring at it. And then we could see a wire running out of it and heading off towards the house like a bomb. And all night we'd been sitting there with it right next to us. So we sort of tapped the boss on the shoulder and said, hey, look at that. We had to put AWS staff between the bomb tech um, and the house. And I guess I was one of the new guys and that was me. <laughs> It was a long day, no food, really hot, stuck out exposed in your black gear with your ballistic helmet and your armour on, so it's a pretty long day. They had taken firearms from the house, they'd broken into the firearm safe, and when we saw later in the bedroom where they'd actually got a hacksaw and sawn the barrels off some of the weapons and the barrels and all the filings were all sitting on the floor in the bedroom of one of these houses. So that sort of heightened uh, the whole situation. Police have just told us that they found guns and ammunition on a beach near this luxury hideaway house. At first light, the squads made their move. At low tide, we walked around the rocks to the area where they had um, last been seen, and then we deployed. I looked ahead up into the scrub and there was something there that just was out of place and I scoped, and then I realised that it was a person, and when I challenged him, um, he put his head up, and I knew it was um, Arthur Taylor. Handcuffed him, and then we proceeded down the hill. He looked pretty, pretty tuckered, I'd have to say. I think he'd been in the bush for a day or two, and he looked pretty, pretty buggered to me. The three remaining prisoners were recaptured over the next few days and Tairua returned to normal. Armed offenders' call-outs have always been a media magnet. But by the mid-90s, as news reporting got faster, often the first information from the front line to the wives at home came via the TV. The drama at the police station caught the quiet Waikato farming town by surprise just after lunch. As the siege unfolded, armed police converged on Morrinsville from all over the Waikato region. The one time that I really feared for him was the Morrinsville shooting. That was the f one of those jobs that you just knew it was the real thing. The situation was bizarre, if you like, a kidnapping and a hostage-taking in a police station. You're holding seven people. That's right. 
Have you got a gun? Explosives. What kind of explosives? Explosives. All right, just take it like that. The Homes Programme had been contacted by Larry Hammond, and so the phone line in and out of that police, the Morrisville Police Station was was locked um, to the Homes Programme. He's uh, busy wiring up uh, explosives at the moment. Do you know this fellow, Larry? I've only spoken to him once. He's claiming that uh, microchips were put into his head and uh, has been suffering uh, electrical shock treatment ever since. He's got a crossbow in his hands at the moment. When we called in the building, uh, I was a sniper or a, a marksman on the squad, so I'd, I'd picked a fire escape uh, looking down on the police station, and I remember thinking, I wonder if this guy's got the arm safe open. It was a logical thing, you know, there's a police station there, uh, there's weapons there, has he got the um, safe open, and could he be lining me up with a rifle? And, and I moved because I felt too exposed. Get away, get away, get away! <laughs> My heart just sank and I just thought, oh, because they said that someone had been shot and that a police officer had been hurt. And I knew it was their squad that had gone to the call out because it's their area. Everybody here. Everyone's out. Right. Real fear it was actually. I really did start to feel a bit panicky when I heard what had happened. And within probably five minutes of hearing that breaking news, he phoned me and said, don't worry, it wasn't me. The offender was shot. A police officer was shot by the offender with a crossbow bolt. Um, and uh, when the scene examination was done, the explosive devices were capable of detonating. So it was, um, a, you know, a serious situation. Family man and Auckland squad commander Tim Masters has dealt with many call-outs in his time, but one in particular is burned in his memory. My granddad. Your granddad? He's shot my brother. Your granddad has shot your brother? Yes, and I think he's going to shoot me. Linda, who had secreted herself in a cupboard at the family house, and um, she'd heard Brian Slafer come looking for her, and she had the presence of mind to hide, and she'd also got onto the phone. Where's Granddad? I don't know. He's probably testing up. He's probably more looking for me. He's either looking for your mum or he's looking for you. Mm. So as the police AOS operation unfolded, they realised how serious the situation was as they came across bodies in different parts of the property. The problem was we didn't know where Brian Slafer was. It was a priority to get Linda out of that house, you see, because they couldn't leave her in there because the possibility that Brian Slaver would come across her and kill her. By lunchtime and still no sighting of Brian Schlafer, despite the police using infrared technology in the search. If Brian Schlafer does hear uh, any of this news broadcast, please contact us and let us know where we can make a safe approach to you. Don't hang up the phone, leave the phone off and you come back as soon as you can and see me. The grandfather has gone outside to try and kill the father who's working out in the garden somewhere. She hasn't seen him for about 15 minutes now. I went out with... Um, with three or four or five other members and a member of the St John Ambulance at the time to get her and, and bring her out. We had deployed snipers out in, into the area, so we had cover when we went out there to get Linda back. Um, and of course, we had to be aware that he could be anywhere on the property. Your senses were certainly heightened. Behind any tree or building, he could be there, you see. So, uh, we, were, we were aware of that, and our tactics uh, going out to the house had to take all that into consideration. We've had six murders committed, and we're desperate that there's no more. For Tim's wife, Linda, hearing this tragedy play out live on air was very worrying. It's on the radio. You're at work, and you're, you've got half an ear on that, and for other people, it's just another normal day at work. And you're thinking, oh, yes, but, uh, um, you know, is there going to be someone come home tonight or not? Just stay where you are, all right? Yeah. Just listen to the instructions very, very carefully, all right? Yeah. Don't you unlock the door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we got her and the, the relief on her face, definitely, you know, when, again, without emphasising what she had witnessed and had been through, yeah, we were just glad to get her out of there. 
coming back out, our sniper at the time, Linda just stuck to him like glue. You know, you couldn't have put a cigarette paper between the two of them. Yeah, you could see what she perhaps witnessed and been through etched in her face. Less than an hour later, it was all over. The gunman's body was found on the family farm. Brian Schlafer, suicide. His wife, three sons, daughter-in-law and grandson, murdered. For the police, it was a massive operation of the saddest kind. He comes home. Hello. He lay down in the doorway and went to sleep. And I knew that that was the mental stress of the day. So I just left him there to sleep and eventually he woke up, go to bed as normal and nothing said. But sometime in the middle of the night he woke up and that's when he'd start talking about it. So you just learnt that there will come a time and you wait for the time you don't push it. So much of the mental stress of being on the armed defenders squad comes from a heavy responsibility borne by the members. The responsibility to make the right call every time. Sasha Haskell, Sid Edgerton and Derek Webb have all been painted into a corner by the actions of offenders. It started here at five past three. Sasha's squad had been called to a domestic in Wainuia Mata. Police got a call a man was armed with a .22 pump action rifle. Shots had been fired. He said that he would come out of the house and shoot anyone that he saw, and that he was going to walk down to the police station and kill everyone in the police station. And there was a fence separating his house from where I actually was. I was with a, a colleague, and we were um, lying on the driveway. When you sort of looked through the fence, you could actually see in, in between gaps, and you could I just started seeing him walking, walking down. It was really frightening. You know, if he sees me, he's going he's gonna to shoot me. Yeah, come on, boy. On the west coast, Sid Edgerton was called to back up a colleague being stalked by a gunman. Come on, Jock. He came screeching around the corner, and um, he's just, the offender was walking up. We recognised him because we knew him before. And, through the old Commodore into neutral and just sort of dragged the handbrake on to let her slow down and we bailed me out one side, him out the other and put a challenge into him to, to let him know we were armed police. He sort of brought his shotgun round towards me and I had mine lined up on the back of his head at that stage. Everything just seemed to have slowed up. Derek Webb found himself looking through his sniper's scope at a man threatening his squad with a rifle. A number of emotions go through you. You're watching through the scope, you're watching his face, you know what he looks like, you know the actions he's going on about, he's, you're watching his body movements. So there's a bit of, how can I put it, intimacy there. You really have to assess every second in it, on, on its own merits, because he may have very easily just dropped the, the rifle on the ground at any given moment. So you're constantly thinking about your justification. Drop it! It's just amazing how much the old brain's computing in seconds, or less than seconds. You know, it's just all happening, and it's all going and I could see it all. Police officers shoot men and, and back, and that would have been the sensational news item of the night. And it's going through your mind, and I'm thinking, well, there's no other option here. He was then called on to, to drop the firearm and um, he turned around. The police dogs were released on him and he sh shot at one of them. The person sitting next to me did shoot him and, and I didn't. I had their safety off trigger being pulled as he pulled the shotgun back round and put it in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Which was a pretty traumatic result. Very, very quickly, in a matter of a split second, he pulled the rifle up and he took a shot at one of the guys. And fortunately, uh, he missed. But he reloaded and started to take aim. And so it was necessary at that stage to um, take the shot. We went forward. We. Um, Obviously tried to give him first aid, we called up an ambulance, and uh, rather unfortunately, he died. He has been shot. Repeat, he has been shot. Can I get an ambulance there immediately over? 
it was something that I played over in my mind over and over and over again. I probably felt at the time that I'd failed in some respect. Did I do the right thing? Uh, could I have done this in a less um, violent manner? And it was something actually that I thought I was going through on my own, but I spoke to a couple of people that had actually fired. They said, oh, I felt like a failure. And I was like, wow, you know, they're going through exactly the same thought processes, but we, we did different things. Luckily enough for me, it was just taken out of my hands at the last moment. Yeah, if he hadn't have done that, and I'd squeezed the trigger. God knows what would have happened from there. She would have been a full-on investigation, and um, someone that has all day and every day for the next two years can make a decision as to whether or not I'd made the right decision in that much time. After any fatal shooting, AOS members are investigated by homicide detectives, the coroner's court, and the independent police conduct authority. Every shooting is treated like a, a normal homicide, um, and our members are subject to an enormous amount of investigating involving both the responsibility of the shooter, the responsibility of the, the section as a wider group, and obviously the police operation um, that led to that call out. I had a discussion with my supervisor at that stage. I actually said to him, does this mean I'm off the team? Uh, and I, I think I've voiced an opinion. If, if I'm off the team, I'll feel as though I've done something wrong. It took a year and a half of investigation for Derek Webb to be cleared after firing that fatal shot. So anybody that thinks, you know, that um, you live happily ever after after one of those things is, um, you know, you don't, you're in limbo for quite some time. It is a world in which you don't know what's going to happen to you. The intense media scrutiny after a shooting prompted members to pull on their balaclavas, less for the warmth than for their anonymity. If I was in the unfortunate position to be involved in a shooting like that as the shooter, then I wanted to protect my identity and that of my family for as long as I could. We did an operation on a, on a gang pad. When we got in there and took over the place, in their living room they had a dartboard, and on the dartboard was, uh, lo and behold, my photograph taken from a newspaper article. So in protecting your identity, you also protect your family's identity. The balaclava also provides another way to protect life. Balaclavas are intimidating, and there are times when um, you need to confront an offender, and he needs to know that you, that you mean business. Otherwise, there may be a different result. If a police officer, regardless of what he's wearing, blue or black, if his presence is intimidating enough, that dominates the, if the offender into, into giving himself up, surrendering, or doing as he's told, then, then, then you're halfway there. Often at briefings, you'd be told that this offender, there's no way the police will take him alive, and he'll, he'll shoot the first cop he sees. When you dominate them and they're faced with guys in black gear pointing weapons at them, the bravado is just lost. They're not so brave. If it's intimidating, no apologies. But sometimes the covert approach is the most effective. One of the biggest local news stories of 2002 was the abduction of little baby Kahu. The eight-month-old girl was grabbed from outside her lower hut home, launching a massive police search. It gets increasingly more disheartening as time goes on. To stack the odds in their favour, police employed the crack surveillance skills of the Special Tactics Group, sending them to the King Country on the strength of a tip-off from locals. We'd managed to narrow it down to a house in Tamaranui. We were involved in observation of an address for um, a couple of days, a property that we wanted to um, either roll in or roll out of the, of the inquiry. There was no sign, there was no noise coming from it, and uh, the offender had gone away that, that next day. So uh, we thought we can't wait around any longer. Time was a, was a critical factor, particularly when you're, when, you're, when you're talking about a baby. The decision was made that we, we needed to do, take some positive action to either um, confirm or deny that this property was involved or this person was involved. Moving silently, the team entered the house. Clear through the kitchen, 
There's nothing there, and then carried on clearing down through the hallway. We just came into this room that was lined with plywood. In one corner, here she was, baby cow, who was just sitting in a cot. And um, it was just overwhelming to see her there and to see her. She was alive. She was. The room was warm. She was. She seemed good as gold. You've probably never seen a bunch of blokes smile so so broadly before, you know. One job that really affected him was probably the baby kahu story. A lot of the, the people involved thought that um, the baby would be dead, and so they were preparing themselves for that. And then the fact that they found her and she was alive, then that was fantastic. I felt, you know, quite a lot of emotion coming across me at that stage because I had kids myself. <coughs> to the guys um, I, was, I was working with, he just whisked her out of the room, out the hallway, out the back door, and um, into a van, and they just took off. And then it was sort of, OK, now what do we do? So we were kitted up and driving around with a little baby in the back. Got directed to the um, base hospital. And, you know, there's a couple of us sitting in the back with this little baby thinking, well, what do we do? We did, um, or maybe we'll give us something to play with, but obviously didn't, don't generally carry um, things for kids on us, so gave her a glow stick, which, which you break, and um, got all sorts of chemicals inside it. And just as we gave it to her, we thought, well, hang on, maybe that's not the best thing to give a little girl, little baby. So we took that off her. And we knew that the defender was probably likely to come back that, that late that afternoon or late that night, so we had to set up a plan to capture him. A matter of hours afterwards, um, he was obviously un unaware that the, uh, the child had been recovered and um, returned back to the address, and, yeah, we were waiting for him. was just monstered, face down the ground, handcuffs applied, and that was it. Handed over to the CIB investigators and job done. Another job resolved without a shot being fired. But with violent crime on the rise and a new drug culture sweeping the cities, the stakes are getting higher and higher. As the new millennium wears on, violent crime in New Zealand is constantly in the headlines. The job of policing in this country has never been more dangerous. Having been overseas for the last sort of five or six years and coming back, New Zealand's incredibly violent. The nature of the call-outs, um, the level of violence, um, the frequency of firearms and the unpredictability really of some of the offenders meant that some of the AOS tactica, tactics had to become more assertive, more aggressive if you like. The chap in front of me, um... He would have been about 17, 18 years old. He had a box cutter, pulled the box cutter out, flicked the blade on, turned at us and decided he was going to have a go. And uh, as opposed to shooting him, I decided to put the, uh, the butt of the shotgun through his jaw. And it dropped him in a hurry. But um, you know, under those circumstances, you get about half a second to decide what you're going to do. And uh, I chose not to shoot him. Reasons for the increased violence are well documented. Although hidden P labs were being raided as early as 99, now police are busting hundreds of labs per year in Auckland alone. This marks a new era for the AOS. It's had a huge impact, huge impact. You'll find labs out in the country these days, labs in industrial blocks, labs in homes where the kids are playing around. Most of the jobs, the squads attend, P's are featuring there somewhere. The methamphetamine, there's um, inevitably gang involvement, um, firearms are involved, so you know, AOS are involved in, in the majority of operations. The squads are now honing new skills and training to meet the changing demands of this dangerous new world. Comply with our instructions and you will not be harmed. These evolving tactics were tested on an Auckland motorway in 2005. Leonard Hall, criminal, propensity for violence, drugs. Police patrol had tried to stop him earlier on. That ended up in a car chase. Police followed him here to St Luke's shopping centre, where the man shot at a patrol car. Fired shots at police with a high-powered semi-automatic rifle. And then he managed to carjack a, uh, an Asian family. We just headed out to the general area where the pursuit was going on, and, uh, and we only referenced one of the media helicopter that was above it. Drug abuser, armed, fires shots, has hostages, um, is mobile. 
is heading back in towards the city, we needed to bring it to an end. We had to confront the offender, there was no other option. We were going to do that by way of uh, non-compliant vehicle stop. So it's just forcing the vehicle off the road and, and confronting the offender um, and giving him no, no option, the vehicle stopped. It was just lucky that we'd carried out that training with the armed offender squad only two or three days prior to that incident. There was certainly a, a fair number of AOS cars involved. And in fact, during the course of that chase, he had, he'd not only leant out the window and, and pointed that firearm at police members, he'd also fired shots at them as well. He's uh, leaning right out the back window and uh, pointed directly at us. We fired a shot over, they carried on. The motorway was completely clear. It had been blocked by um, the traffic units. So we were in a pretty good space to resolve it. As we got into position, the director was given that sort of on a countdown that we would uh, stop the vehicle. And that's it. Now. Hauled by that stage, had bailed out of the vehicle. He couldn't have got out of the vehicle any quicker or any closer to the ground. And that's the whole intention is to sort of shock the offender. Separated him from his gun, that was secure. The, uh, the hostages were safe. Uh, very much shaken up and traumatised by the whole event, but otherwise everything went according to plan. In 2009, on the same stretch of motorway, the armed offenders squad making headlines once again. The tragic shooting of a courier driver on Auckland's Northwestern motorway was the first shooting of an innocent bystander in the squad's 45-year history. While investigations ultimately cleared the squad member of criminal negligence, the pressure on the AOS intensified. And while talkback radio was still running hot, the city of Napier was shut down for three days by a gunman killing a police constable and shooting up the neighbourhood. Gunman Jan Molinar. According to a friend, he's well armed and prepared to die. <laughs> In the face of incredible public pressure, putting themselves in the line of fire on every operation, what drives these men and women to do this job? Some people would just stand there and shake their heads and say, why? Look at the commitment that it's putting upon you in, in, in your job. Look at, look at what it's asking of the family. It's doing right for good people. That's why I love doing the job. That's why I got out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning when the pager went off. That's why I was away for days on end at times. How many other jobs can you say people will get out of the bed at 2 in the morning, spend four hours and then go to work for the day? This is the police! They do it for love or they do it for service. They don't do it to get paid because they're not reimbursed for what toll that takes on someone's life, you know? There's a lot of people that are alive today because of their actions. Not dead because of them, but alive because of them. That must be the most successful armed response unit in the world in terms of the number of call-outs attended and had to resort to the ultimate force on very, very few occasions. The police officer is there as an agent on behalf of the public at large, the community. And uh, the responsibility at the end of the day has to be shared by the beneficiaries, and that is the public at large. We put them there, and that responsibility is ours, each and every one of us. It's not good enough for the public to put the whole blame, the whole responsibility, if you like, for shooting or killing on the shoulders of the officer who pulled the trigger. The whole of the squad that was involved, the whole of the police service, and the whole of the community that's responsible for the police have to share that burden. It's a terrible burden. You can't just place it on one person's shoulders. <laughs>